Hello and welcome to the fifth video of crafting interpreters in Swift. If you haven't checked the previous videos, I recommend you to watch them because there I explain what this series is about and I go through all the steps that the interpreter does before getting into today's video. So to talk about the last step that the interpreter does, actually running the, the interpreter itself, we're gonna use the example that we have been using for all the past episodes and we're gonna see how this code actually gets executed. If you remember, at this point on the interpreter, we have the output from the parser, which is our abstract syntax tree, but on the previous episode we saw how that gets enhanced with the resolver, which tells the interpreter in which scope to find each definition of each variable. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uncomment the last line, the interpret line, we're going to run this and see how actually the code is run correctly as we expect. The interpreter class itself is not that different from the resolver class that we saw on the previous episode. Both of them conform to the visitor pattern and what they do is they visit each node on the abstract syntax tree. The difference is their purpose. The resolver was visiting and gathering information about the scopes and, and send, giving that information to the interpreter and the interpreter is actually the class that while it's visiting each node on the tree, it's going to actually run some code to perform the actions that the writer of the program desired. Writing this part of the interpreter is not really that hard thanks to be writing it in a hosted language. What I mean by that is that a lot of the things that we are going to see today are actually just executing Swift code. For example, you're going to see that when we find a multiplication, we just run the multiplication code in Swift. When we want to print something to the screen, we actually use Swift to convert whatever we need to print into a string and then use the native Swift printing functions to do that. By that, I mean that it will be much harder if we were writing this in a lower level language or, for example, if we were writing a bytecode machine, for example which is something that the second part of Crafting Interpreters does. Just so you remember, this project is based on the first part of the Crafting Interpreters book. That part writes an interpreter based on an after syntax tree and running that like automatically and basically executing the code visiting each node as I'm saying now. But the second part of the book rewrites this language using a bytecode machine written in C. So if we want to see an interpreter alternative to what we're seeing today, I really recommend you to read the second part of that book. The other thing I want to mention before starting to take a look at the code is, as I said on the first episode, is this, what I'm showing now is actually the last changes that I did in this code months ago when the book was finished. You're going to see some commented code, especially in the interpreter class, and some weird thing around trying to mix the Swift thro error throwing system with a result type and how I'm kind of fighting the any type combination with optionals and nils. It, all these combination of things are actually a little messy. In any case, you're going to be able to see how the interpreter executes code and how it performs the actions that the writer of the program wants. So to start with, let's take a couple of classes that the interpreter needs to execute code at runtime. That's what I have here in this runtime folder because all of this is actually code, it's used at runtime. So the log scalable protocol is a protocol that specifies to the conforming types what they need to be able to be called at runtime. This is basically the types that can be used with a function call syntax, basically the open and close parentheses. The protocol specifies the arity of the call and actually a call function where you give the interpreter and the arguments that are passed. As you can see, we already start seeing any's and throwings and any's with optionals. And as I was saying, this will, it's kind of a mess in this version of the interpreter, but for the lab, but let's take a look anyway. The first class that implements the log scalable protocol is this anonymous scalable. It's basically used to have a nice way of creating like a runtime function where you pass a call closure that you can execute from Swift. This is used on the interpreter to define a global clock function that actually executes Swift code, like native Swift code, called from the logs runtime. This is really nice because you can start adding more functions in this global environment. This basically allows you to provide 
functionality to logs programs, but written in the native code, as it, in this case is Swift. If you want to do something bigger, like provide a standard library or bridging between native code and the uh, interpreted logs code, this is probably not the best solution, but that's an improvement for another version of the interpreter. The second class that implements the logs callable is actually a logs function, and this is what it's used to execute the logs code that the user writes. You can see how this function needs basically parts of the abstract syntax tree, it needs the environment that it can capture, and it has some parameter to, the, to decide if it's an initializer or not. This environment we're going to take a look now, because this is a key part of, uh, of the interpreter. The environment is just a class that wraps a dictionary from the key, which is the name of the variable you want to access, a variable or a name of the function or a class, whatever you, an identifier that you want to access, and actually that instance of the object. The interesting thing here is that it has this enclosing environment. This allows us to nest environments, and this is what defines the scopes of the code that we are going to run. And we just have some classes to access and modify the environment, nothing much, nothing special. But with this, we can now understand, which is for me was one of the most exciting things. When we're creating a function and we detect that it's a closure, basically, what the only thing we need to do is to pass the, the environment where that function is defined. This means that all that environment is accessible to that closure and that's how closures are implemented in this language. It's much easier than I would expect when I was starting to write this interpreter, and it's surprising to see how one of these more powerful and in some languages even just modern features are... it's not that hard to implement. Now, when this function is executed, what we do is create a new environment and we pass this closure environment, so the, the, the environment that was given us uh, when this callable was created. And then the first thing we do is we iterate over all the parameters that have been given to us and defining on this current environment. So the code that actually executes the block of the function, the body, has access to them. Then if something goes wrong, we return we return an error, we throw an error, or we return the actual value or nil in, in case that the, the function returns nil. The logs class is another type that implements logs callable. If you think about it, it makes completely sense because the class, the type itself, it's something that you call because you use the open and close parentheses syntax to create an instance of that class. So that's the reason why the logs class actually implements a logs callable. The logs class is basically the runtime representation of a class in logs code. It has a name, you can pass a super class, and you can give it the methods that it has access to. As you can see, it has two ways of being called. If there is an initializer defined, it means that the user wrote a custom initializer and we need to pass the, the RET of that function. If not, we just return zero and basically construct the default instance of this class. When we create an instance of this class, we make sure to bind it to the class that is originating from, and we act and we also give it access to the interpreter and to the arguments that were passed to the constructor. This is so later this instance can ac can have access to the class, which is the one that defines the methods. And finally, we have the logs instance, which, as the name implies, it's a runtime representation of an instance of a logs class. As we just saw, we passed the logs class in the initializer, and as you can see, the only thing the logs instance has is it keeps the fields that it has in memory and, and provides functionality to change them or to have access to them. If you want to run code on this instance, if you want to call a method on this instance, all that it's done through the class itself. So the class is the runtime object that keeps that, the methods. And with this, we are ready to take a look at the interpreter. The first thing that we saw on the interpreter file is the interpreter error. The interpreter error have two actual jobs. One of them is obviously to represent an error at runtime. Basically, that throws an error and it stops the program and it, and it shows to the user a nice error with a token that make a fail and some message saying, for example, oh, this variable was not defined or something else happened. But apart from that, we have two other cases that are not actually errors. One is to break from a loop and the other is to implement the return statement. 
This is because we are using our Swift call stack and throwing errors to basically unwind the call stack and get out of the current loop or, for example, get out of the current function. This is really nice because it means that we don't have to write any specific code to do this. We can just use the natural stack calls from Swift, even if we are using throwing errors as a kind of a hack to have this functionality. The class itself, when it's created, it already creates a global environment where all the globals are saved. And to start with, it sets this global environment as the current environment. This current environment is the one that keeps changing when new scopes are created. As we saw, the environment keeps a reference to the outer environments, so the interpreter can go to the specific scope to get the, the identifier that it needs. This information, as we saw, we, it comes from the resolver, and you can check the previous video. And then, as we are already used from now, the main entry point into the interpreter is the interpret functions, which receives an array of statements. The interpreter just goes over all of them and starts executing them. And this execute function, it's the one that uses the visitor pattern to visitor all the nodes on the tree and use itself as the visitor. If this accept method returns any kind of error, it just throws and it stops the execution as we have seen before. Here we have a generic function that executes a block of statements with an environment. And the first thing it does, it, it saves the previous environment and, and sets up this deferred statement to restore after the execution has happened. And then it simply just goes through all the statements and starts executing them. We have some private functions here to convert any kind of object to string, and we have some code here to deal with some Swift specific behavior. This is basically to keep the same behavior as the Java implementation. And here we have the resolve function that you can remember from the previous episode. This is what the resolver uses to set the, the specific def at which an expression declaration is found. And now we start with our visitor functions. Some of them are really simple and just recursively call visit to visit all the nodes, but some of them actually run code. So let's take a look at some interesting ones. Probably the most simple one is the visit literal. It basically, it already has access to the expression, so it just grabs the value from the expression. And if it actually, if there is a value, it just re returns the, a success with that value. Logical expressions like or, or, and, and do some previous checks to make sure they only check for the first part of the expression. And if that expression is true or false, depending on the case, they short circuit and they just return the, that part. If not, they need to go to the right part of the expression and evaluate it recursively. A set expression is interesting because it's the first time that we see the usage of the logs instance. Basically, the set needs to happen into an instance of a class. So we first make sure to get the, the instance itself. And then once we have the instance, we evaluate the, the expression that we want to set. And if this expression doesn't fail, we finally call the set method on the instance, which is going to modify the value that the, the instance property is saving. The visit super uses these locals that save the distance for the specific identifiers, and it checks for the super and the this, and then it just uses the, the class that it found to find the specific method. In the similar way, the visit this, it just looks looks up the variable with the specific keyword, and this variable, it's, tr it's tried to be find into the locals, and the locals, which this is what the resolver help us with. And if it's not there, we, we check if it's on the globals, and if it's not there, we just throw an error. The visit binary expression shows what I was talking about. In this case, for example, if we find the, the binary has a star type, it means that we are multiplying. And we basically, if we ignore this casting that we need to actually make sure that the number types are correct, and it's basically a generic function that helps with that. But at the end of the day, we have uh, numeric types here, and we actually run Swift code that multiplies them. The same for minus and the same for the division. The plus, it's a special special case in this language because, as in many other languages, it has different meanings. So we have this operator that has different meanings, like if it's a string, we actually want to concatenate them, which is what we do here. And if it's a, a double or a number, we want to do an addition. You can see here how the rest of operations are done, basically just running the Swift code. The visit call expression is one of these complex ones, because apart from recursively following the, the tree structure, it actually uses the classes and the instances to actually run the specific code. 
So we can see here how what we do is we make sure that the object we are treating with is actually a log scalable and we treat that as a function. But to get that, first we need to evaluate the object that it's passed in order to get this first function that we can call. And if this check fails, basically it means that we're trying to call a function on something that it's not actually a function or any or a class for initializers. But once we have a function, before calling it, we need to actually evaluate all the arguments of the function. This is executed in order and because this language doesn't have anything like default arguments on any kind of stuff, this is actually deterministic and it means that all the code that you put on the arguments is going to execute on the same order as you put them. Then we check that the RET matches. If a function says that we need to pass two parameters, we cannot pass three or one because this is going to make an error. And finally, with all these checks and with all this information gathered, we actually can call the function with the arguments. We're going to skip over all these visits because there is no point in going over all of them. Like a lot of them are just similar and you can read the the code in github if you want but let's just stop in a couple of them for example the if statement you can check how we literally write an if statement in swift and the condition of our or swift statement is actually the condition that the user wrote and the same for the else if there is an else branch we check for the condition of that if not, we just don't execute anything. And in the same vein, the print statement just evaluates the expression that needs to be printed and then it uses the print function and stringifying the object that we want to print. But as you can see, we actually use Swift code to perform the actions. And finally, the while statement is done in the same way. We literally write a while in Swift and the condition is the condition the that the user wrote. So as you can see, once you have the abstract syntax tree and you have something to visit it and you have uh, an environment and some runtime classes that you can play with, with like a callable and clause and the instance, then it's just a matter of writing the code that you know as a programmer that it should be executed. For additions, you add things, you need to make sure that they are numbers and that kind of stuff. But it's not super hard when you have all the infrastructure. Now, as you can see here, there are a lot of things to be improved, there are a lot of things to change, and that's something that I wrote about on my blog post where I announced that I finished the implementation of the interpreter in Swift. You can read this blog post, you see that I improvements that I would like to make. You can see that some of the improvements are around error handling because I tried to use resource library because I was not really happy with throwing errors in Swift without types. And you can check here you can check here that at some points I started just forecasting the errors to be interpreter errors because there is was no other any other kind of errors that my code throws, but still the, inter the Swift compiler does, doesn't help with that. And because I was bridging it to the result type to have a more type safe interface, then I had basically forecast this kind, this kind of errors and that's something I would like to improve. The other thing is that you see that all the types that I pass are any types. And this has caused some issues, especially around handling nils and optional. You can see here that the I have a dirty hack that it's basically a constant nil any to basically, I use this to check if what it's been passed is actually a nil hidden inside an any because this can happen in Swift. If you start using any, the difference between an optional with some value inside and the difference between an optional and no value inside, it just gets hidden by the by the compiler, which makes sense because any can be any kind of type, but it's still a pain in the ass and it causes me some, some issues that I didn't have any other way to solve. And apart from that, we could be adding more features to this. There is a bunch of things that you could add to a language. If you are a fan of programming languages, I'm pretty sure that you have some ideas from other languages that you would like to implement. And it could be interesting to grab this interpreter if you like this version of it or some other implementations of it or you want to implement it by yourself. But it, it will be an interesting exercise now that you have all this infrastructure for an interpreter for a language to expand it and add more functionality on top of it. 
there are a lot of challenges on the book that are not done so that's a good start for it so that's it with this we got at the end of this episode and at the end of the series i hope you like this series and i would really appreciate the any feedback any comments you can leave comments on this video you can find me on my twitter on alexito4 and you can read my blog at alejandromp.com i really hope you enjoyed this because i really had so much fun not only writing the interpreter but also recording these videos so i hope you like it and you subscribe so you get a notification when i upload a new video about swift or uh, other programming related topics thank you for watching and see you next time